Welcome to our first video in our series on photosynthesis. This video will be an overview, giving us important background information we will need for our investigation into photosynthesis. Other videos in this series will take a closer look at the light dependent reactions, the photophosphorylation of ATP or chemiosmosis, the Calvin cycle, and the alternative pathways of carbon fixation as seen in the C4 and CAM plants. So what do we know about how plants and other photosynthetic organisms make their food? What do plants need? We know that plants take in carbon dioxide. They need water and they need energy in the form of light. They use these ingredients to produce sugars and in doing so they liberate oxygen. So here's our overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis. But like we learned in our introduction to metabolism video, overall reactions don't tell the whole story. In fact, Photosynthesis is a complex series of reactions that take place in two stages, the light dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle or carbon fixation. So here's the short story. In the light reactions we take in light and water. These are used to trap energy from the sun to form ATP and generate high energy electrons. During the light reactions water is split which uh, replenishes the electrons that are going to be lost out of light reactions, um, creates hydrogen ions that we're going to use, and also liberates the oxygen that we see in the overall reaction. Now, the high energy electrons that we make here in the light reactions, plus these hydrogen ions, get picked up by a molecule called NADP to form NADPH. This is an energy carrier for us. It's carrying those high energy electrons and those hydrogens. And it's in the light reactions that we release oxygen. So in short, the light reactions take in light and water and produce ATP, a molecule called NADPH, which is carrying high energy electrons and hydrogen, and oxygen, which is a waste product. Now let's move on to the Calvin cycle, or carbon fixation. So we take in carbon dioxide from the air. And then delivered to the Calvin cycle from the light reactions are high energy electrons and hydrogens delivered by NADPH. Now we have all the products we need to make the glucose. We have carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens, and high energy electrons to tie them together. But we need a power source. We need to add energy, and that energy comes from ATP. ATP is going to drive the reactions of the Calvin cycle. We're going to reuse that energy in those reactions to rearrange these molecules into the high energy bonds of glucose. So we can summarize the Calvin cycle as taking in carbon dioxide and producing glucose, but it needs help from the light reactions. It needs those products from the light reactions, the energy delivered by ATP, and the high energy electrons to build these high energy bonds of glucose, and the hydrogens, because glucose is carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. Now in our other videos, we're going to get into the details of how this is actually happening on the molecular level, on the cellular level, uh, at the organelle level, what's actually going on in the light reactions, and the processes and the uh, reactions of the Calvin cycle. But before we do that, in this video, we need to go over some of, some of the bigger ideas first, some of the background information, and we need to talk about the nature of light. Now light is energy emitted as photons, which can act as both particle and waves. And since light is driving photosynthesis, we need to kind of investigate its nature a bit. What do we know about the speed of a wave? Well, we know that the velocity equals the wavelength times the frequency. So let's get a pen here. The velocity of wave equals the wavelength, the lambda, times the frequency. But what do we know about the speed or velocity of light? Well, it occurs at the speed of light, which is uh, approximately 671 million miles per hour. Well, so that equals, let me grab a pen again, that equals wavelength times frequency because speed of a wave is wavelength times frequency. So wavelength times frequency. But this is a constant. <laughs> the speed of light is always the speed of light. It doesn't matter what color of light. In fact, all electromagnetic energy travels at the speed of light. So if this number is a constant, then what do we know about how wavelength and frequency are related? Well, hopefully you can understand that if this number can't change, that if wavelength goes up, frequency has to go down, or vice versa, as wavelength goes down, frequency is going to go up. 
So we can see that for light, wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. When we're talking about light and its ability to help us make an energy rich molecule, so we need to talk about the energy of light. Different wavelengths of light carry different amounts of energy. So let's look at how we understand that. We need to look at a concept called, or, or um, uh, equation called Planck's constant. Planck's constant is E equals HF, where E stands for energy, H is Planck's constant, and F is frequency. And again, since this number is a constant, we can see the relationship between energy and frequency, and therefore the relationship between energy and wavelength, so that as uh, frequency goes up, and this is a constant, then energy would go up. But as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. So we know that the shorter the wavelengths, the higher the energy, and the longer the wavelengths, the lower the energy, or vice versa, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, and the lower the frequency, the lower the energy. We also know that different wavelengths of light equal different colors. When we look across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, when we talk about light, we talk about visible light, which goes from the reds to the violets. Uh, Roy G. Biv may be something that's familiar to you. Um, and sunlight is a mixture of these different wavelengths. Now I'm talking about this because ultimately it's light that's going to be the driving force to add the energy into our system. The chemical bonds of glucose have high energy because they've absorbed, they, they represent um, the absorbed energy of light. So how does uh, a molecule absorb light energy? Let me back up and do that again. When a molecule uh, gets struck by light, that photon of light can strike an electron and cause it to jump to a higher energy level. Now often when an electron gets boosted to a higher energy level, it immediately will drop back down and emit that energy back out in the form of either light or heat. The key for us is to try to trap the electron while it's at that higher energy state. So when light strikes the electron, knocks it up in energy, if we can grab it while it's at this energy state and put it into a bond at that point, at that state, that bond will have a higher energy to it than if we just use an electron that's back down at its, its resting uh, state or I should say at its ground state. When sunlight hits plants, the energy uh, of light is absorbed by the different pigments in the plant. Different pigments will absorb different wavelengths of light, aka different energies of light. If not absorbed, uh, the wavelength is reflected. So I ask you this question, what color are most plants? Well, hopefully you came up with green. Because chlorophyll is the major photosynthetic pigment. It's absorbing some wavelengths of light, but reflecting the green. So let's look at uh, these graphs here that show, these are two different graphs kind of showing the same thing. I think maybe one's easier to understand than the other. Um, that show the different wavelengths of light that are absorbed by the major photopigments found in plants. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and the carotenoids, which are some of the orange and yellow pigments. Um, we're going to focus mostly on chlorophyll. Uh, and in this graph, they've kind of combined both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And you can see that chlorophyll is absorbing the blues and the violets and the reds and the oranges, but reflecting a lot of the green and so that's why plants look green. Now if we take a, a closer look at the structure of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, uh, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this or even to recognize it, but uh, what you need to understand is that these molecules are designed such that these pigments that they're really um, sensitive to, to light. They can absorb light energy so when uh, light comes in and strikes this molecule there are electrons in here that uh, when they get struck by light can get boosted to a higher energy level. And again, the key for us is to grab this electron while it's at this high energy. And these molecules are really good at donating these electrons to be boosted to a higher energy level. So where is the chlorophyll? We have to look deep down inside of a leaf. And if we look here at the structural diagram of a leaf, we can see that uh, down in here in these mesophyll cells, these middle layer cells, you see all these little green dots. We need to zoom into one of these cells. And jam-packed in these cells are tons of these uh, dark green circles, these organelles called chloroplasts. Let's take a closer look at a chloroplast. Uh, this is a neat diagram, kind of shows us uh, an artist's rendition of, of a chloroplast, being able to look inside. But let's look at a, a diagram that, um, that has uh, labels on it. So we see the structure of a chloroplast. Chloroplast is a double membrane bound organelle. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And inside the chloroplast, we have this system of stacks of, of membranes. These membranes are called thylakoid membranes. And uh, the thylakoid membranes is where the light reactions are going to occur. And surrounding these stacks of thylakoids is a liquid area called the stroma. 
and the stroma contains the enzymes that are going to run the Calvin cycle. So we said that photosynthesis occurs in two, dist two distinct uh, sets of reactions, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. And if we look inside the chloroplast, we have two distinct regions, the thylakoid region and the liquid stroma surrounding it. But we need to take an even closer look. So let's go back up and look deeper into the chloroplast. In fact, let's zoom in on the thylakoid membrane. If we look in here, there are two structures that are very important to us, two th more things we need to talk about. Photosystems which are going to be our light harvesting complexes where we're going to grab the light and absorb it with these clusters whoops I don't know why that keeps happening these clusters of pigments and also let me make this bigger electron transport chains which we're going to use to uh, tap into the energy of the high energy electrons so let's get to it what is a photosystem a photosystem is a light harvesting complex these are clusters of pigments that are embedded in the thylakoid membrane when light strikes this photosystem, it can boost an electron to a higher energy level. This higher energy electron, I've drawn it red, uh, then bounces around this photosystem. It gets passed from molecule to molecule, and it bounces around until it reaches a special chlorophyll A called the reaction center. At the reaction center, the electron can get picked up by an electron acceptor, and so it's trapped at that higher energy state. And then the electron acceptor is going to deliver the high energy electron to an electron transport chain. So it drops this electron off and we'll talk about electron transport chains in just a minute. So again let's back up and look at this one more time. Here's our photosystem. Light strikes the electron, boosts it to a higher energy level. Whoops, back that up again. Try that one more time. We boost it to a higher energy level. It bounces around the photosystem till it reaches the reaction center. When it reaches the reaction center, an electron acceptor can come in, pick it up, and deliver that electron to an ETC, or electron transport chain. Now when we do our details of light reactions, we're going to talk about two different photosystems. Photosystem 1, also known as P700, and Photosystem 2, uh, P680. And they have slightly different composition of photopigments, and so they, they kind of uh, specialize in different wavelengths of light, and we'll talk about which different um, um, uh, light reaction pathways that they're involved in, and we'll get to that in our later video. But we need to talk about that electron transport chain. The photosystems were embedded in the thylakoid membrane, and so are the electron transport chains. Let's talk about what electron transport chain is. An electron transport chain is a series of enzymes embedded in the thylakoid membrane. Now, the electron acceptor from the uh, photosystem delivers the high energy electron to the ETC. The electron is dropped off. It's easy to think about this like a staircase. And the electron is going to move down the electron transport chain until it gets to the end. And when it gets to the end, it's going to become a, uh, a, it's back to its ground state. So along the way, energy has been given off. And that energy is, is used to drive the production of ATP. So we can say that as the electron goes down the ETC, energy is given off to make ATP. But I put this in here. It says kind of, because there's a bigger story there. And if you recall, that kind is, that it's not happening kind of directly like this. The energy that's given off as the electron goes down the electron transport chain actually drives the um, concentration gradient of hydrogen ions to one side of a membrane and this is going to build up a gradient like water behind a dam which will uh, drive the chemiosmotic production of ATP. So now we have all of our background information. We know what plants take in, what they make, and what they give off. We know that photosynthesis takes place in two distinct reactions, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. And we know that the product of the light reactions are important in driving the Calvin cycle. And we know a bit about the nature of light, and we know that light energy can cause electrons to be boosted to a higher energy state, and we can grab those electrons, we can grab that energy. We know that chlorophyll is the primary photopigment found in plants, and we know that chlorophyll is good at absorbing that light energy and converting it to those electrons to a high energy state. We know that the chlorophyll is found in the deep part of the leaves inside the, in the mesophyll in the chloroplast. We know that chloroplasts have two distinct regions, the thylakoid and the stroma, and that those two regions uh, correspond to the two sets of reactions in photosynthesis. 
and we know that it's the photosystems, the clusters of pigments embedded in the thylakoid membrane, and the electron transport chains that are embedded in the thylakoid membrane that are really going to be where we're doing the work of photo, the light reactions of photosynthesis. So check back, back for the uh, videos on the specifics on these other uh, parts of photosynthesis as we go into more detail on the hows of the light-dependent reaction, how ATP is actually made, the steps of the Calvin cycle, and other ways that we can grab carbon dioxide.